Hi and welcome to the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon. In each episode, we'll talk to or about an interesting person or organization related to journalism. The intent is to show that journalists are not the enemy of the people. Thank you for listening. On today's show, we're joined by Kenneth Partridge. We've done some heavy topics recently, and we switch things up, and we talk music journalism. Music journalism today, says Wikipedia, includes reviews of songs, albums, and live concerts, profiles of recording artists, and reporting of artist news and music events. Ken does all of that. Ken's the managing editor for Genius and the author of the new book, Hell of a Hat, The Rise of 90s Ska and Swing, published by Penn State University Press as part of a series of books about music history. Ken, thanks for joining us. Hey, Mark. But thanks very much for having me. So Ken's done a lot of music writing. He's done it from different outlets online in addition to this book. He's written for Billboard, The Atlantic, The AV Club, and Mental Floss. So first of all, as we ask every guest here, share the story of your journalism path. I had kind of an odd journalism path, I think. I didn't, I didn't study it in college. Um, I was, um, you know, I was up at uh, Boston University, and I was an um, like economics major, actually, and was, you know, doing that all through uh, my four years. And then... With about, I don't know, two or three months left in the school year, I was out for a walk with uh, my roommate, and we happened to bump into a friend of his who was like the arts editor at the at the school newspaper up at Boston University. You know, my friend was like, "Oh yeah, this is Ken. Like he 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 like you know loves music, blah blah blah." And uh, she was like, "Oh, like you should come to you know the meeting for this semester, and you should you know do some writing for us." And I was like, oh, "Okay, cool." So I went and um, I discovered that you could like, you know, go to shows for free and you could get like, you know, free, you know, free records and stuff. And I was like, oh man, this is amazing. And uh, so I, I wrote a bunch for the BU paper in, you know, my final semester of uh, my senior year and kind of realized that I didn't actually want to go into, um, um, you know, to uh, the economic stuff so much after that. So after I uh, graduated college, uh, I just kind of started, you know, sending out pitches to like different places to do, like start doing a little freelancing. And I think the first place that I really started to, to write for was, I was at the Hartford Current, which is, you know, kind of the big paper in up, up in that Connecticut where I'm from. Um, I had, you know, moved back home after graduating and was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And yeah, luckily I just, I sent, I sent some clips from the school paper to uh, the music editor at the Current and he gave me some assignments, start writing album reviews and uh, concert reviews and, um, just kind of gone from there, I guess. All right. So, how did your upbringing influence your journalistic interests? I guess I'd always been a big, a big music fan. I think ever since I got, I got MTV in like the mid '80s. It was, you know, come home from school and watch MTV. And you know, at first it was like the hair metal bands in the '80s, and then probably like you know Vanilla Ice at one point in the early '90s, and MC Hammer and all that stuff, and then all the different you know progressions. I just kind of was always, always paying attention to you know the radio and MTV and. I think by the time I got to uh, to high school, it kind of became, you know, I guess even more of a passion. Um, I'm sorry, when I, I kind of got into these bands that I write about in uh, my book, that was when, you know, music became more than just a, like a thing that, you know, I kind of played on the radio. It became almost almost like a lifestyle or kind of like who I was. It, you know, defined my personality more than it, you know, had before. And yeah, I guess like from that point on, it's just been like one of the biggest parts of my life. When was the moment for you where it turned from, oh, cool, I get these albums and it's really, you know, hip and cool and super fun to um, being someone who's now such a devotee of the history, the historical aspect of it and the like kind of a, the careful writing of it that you do? I guess, I don't know, somewhere along the way, I guess I just figured out that I could sort of keep doing it. You know, it's, it was always like, you go from one assignment to, uh, to the next. And, you know, there's been times when it's been my full-time job. There's been times when I've done, you know, my first job out of college, I was a uh, grant writer. Um, so I, I was, I was doing music uh, journalism on the side. And then I worked as a uh, beat reporter for like a small newspaper uh, for a while. So it's, um, you know, there's been times when it's been like my main gig and there's been times where it's just like a thing I do on the weekends or, or nights just because I love it so much. So yeah, I guess it just kind of slowly kind of crept in to just be like a, like a constant part of my life, I guess. And what were some of the lessons that you learned kind of as you went along, uh, particularly in the early part of your career? That you're not going to make a ton of money. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's one of the things that it's, it's a hustle. I mean, I think like with any kind of, you know, writing that you might do on a freelance basis um, or, you know, I, I think that with a thing like music journalism, there's a lot of people that want to do it. So it's hard to break into, hard to, 
you know, like make a like editor care about your pitch. Hard to, you know, once you land your first assignment somewhere, it's hard to get the second one sometimes, even though you think it would be easier. So I don't know, I guess I just learned some degree of, you know, persistence and I don't know, foolishness, I guess, to try to <laughs> keep on pursuing it. I don't know. Um, all right. So what characterizes your writing? And I preface uh, that by, by saying you've done news, you've done reviews, you've done interviews, you've done some kooky stuff that we're going to get into too. Uh, mm -hmm. And now you've done this encyclopedic book, uh, which is very impressive, which we'll also get to. Uh, what characterizes the way that you write? That's a good question. Um, I guess I would say that I, I like to think that a certain degree of, of um, enthusiasm comes across. I always think that uh, your writing should kind of like reflect the topic. So if you're writing about rock and roll or pop music, uh, like these are fun, exciting topics. It's not, you know, like reporting on uh, the stock market. So like you should like, you know, the text should be lively and it should be evident that you, um, you know, care about it and that you uh, respect it. You're not like looking down on it and I think I always come into anything with a degree of, um, you know, I mean, even back when I used to do more of, of like the album uh, reviews and stuff, I don't, I don't do those so much anymore, but I would always come into it kind of like wanting to enjoy the record. Like I never come in like, hmm, like, yeah, this better be good. Like with a kind of like a scowl on my face. Yeah, I think a lot of people do that. And it's like, you know, I want to have a good experience. Like, you know, like that's just, I, I like music. Like, you know, why wouldn't I want to come in and have a good experience? you know, obviously that isn't always the case. Sometimes things aren't, aren't good or you, you know, the role of criticism is to sort of, you know, not necessarily say like, this is good or, or this is bad, but to sort of, you know, put things in context and try to um, like explain what the artist is, you know, trying to do and like, is it uh, successful on, on those grounds? Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess just like a certain like open-mindedness, I guess is, you know, what I try to bring to stuff. Uh, what journalists influenced you? Were there music journalists that influenced you? Well, I guess like anybody who, you know, likes music journalism, at, like at some point I read all the, you know, Lester Bang stuff that like everybody reads when they're first starting out. Obviously I don't, I don't write like him at all. I don't, you know, he would you know, stay up all night drinking cough syrup and write like, you know, 5,000 word things about like Lou Reed or Van Morrison or whatever. And that's not my, style. <laughs> that's not my style at all. I'm not like a, you know, crazy gonzo journalist like that, but yeah, I like, there's a Rolling Stone writer, um, Rob Sheffield. I would say he's like my, you know, my sort of idol in terms of uh, music journalism. He is very um, enthusiastic about his subjects. He always comes at things from really uh, sort of interesting angles. It's always really heartfelt. Um, you know, he, he's not always a first person writer because I don't, I, I don't always like people when they sort of insert themselves into things, but I think that whenever uh, Rob Sheffield uh, does insert himself into things, it's always really uh, tastefully done and like adds a lot to the piece. And um, yeah, I think, I think he's the best. All right, I want to come back to one of the words that you used there, heartfelt, in a second. Uh, but before I do that, so you've interviewed some pretty notable people. I'm looking at a list here. Rob Thomas, Annie Lennox, Joni Mitchell, Juliana Hatfield. We spent a day with Blondie. There are dozens and dozens of others. Elvis Costello. Some of these are older pieces. Some of them are more recent. Do you have a favorite question-answer sequence uh, that you did with a musician? Yeah, I, I think I do, actually. It was... It was actually part of the uh, Joni Mitchell um, interview, which was just a weird, like that came out of the blue. Like I, I, I never thought in, in, in like a billion years that I would ever talk to uh, Joni Mitchell. I don't even know how I got the assignment. I was, I'd been kind of writing for this magazine called M, you know, the editor just called me up one day and he was like, you know, do you want to talk to, <laughs> talk to Joni Mitchell? And I was like, yeah, that would be, <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, I felt totally, I was, you know, terrified and, you know, cause she's like an absolute legend and, and, I'd always been a fan of her stuff, but I wasn't, I wasn't like necessarily like a hardcore fan of her. So I, I sort of like binged on her stuff for um, however long I had before the interview and like really tried to get up to speed on everything. And anyway, long story short is, you know, we were talking and I was asking her about some, like some song where she had done something like, you know, really spectacular or this like really sort of innovative thing she, she had done in a song. And, and I was kind of asking her, I guess, like how she came up with those kind of ideas. And she was just like, uh, well, I'm a genius. <laughs> and she was like, you know, John Lennon, uh, you know, like he wasn't a genius, but, but, you know, but I'm a genius. And I was, hey, what are you going to say? I mean, she is a genius. <laughs> what a great quote. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's one of those where when you get that kind of quote, um, you, you got to just be like, well, it speaks for itself. That's yeah. pretty great. <laughs> I couldn't it's awesome. luck that she said that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it, 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 it um, probably sounds like she was being, you know, super, uh, 
like, you know, tooting her own horn and like being really boastful. But I think honestly, like the you know, kind of spirit of how she said it was more like, I can't really tell you why I, I did this on that song. I'm just like, you know, my brain works in this weird way. And that's what we call people who like function on that level. We call them geniuses, you know, like I, I think she was just trying to. Like, she was trying to explain question. it. Yeah, she was trying to answer my question, honestly. And it's just. That, that's awesome. I like that. I can relate to that with certain athletes that you speak to that have a hard time explaining their, you know, their baseball excellence. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. For, for example. Um, okay. How, uh, you talked about uh, heartfelt. And again, I want to revisit that. And I think it kind of comes into play here. Music is so important to people. Like the soundtrack of my life is something that you often hear. How do you consider the person that's on the other end of the article? And who do you imagine that you're writing for? Well, I guess, I guess it uh, sort of depends on the piece, um, you know, because I guess you don't always want to assume that they're as, as passionate about the artist as you are, or that they know all the stuff. So it's, it's a combination of, you know, putting in the background, putting in all the information that you need, but also trying to communicate, you know, get some of your own feelings in there too. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I just, you know, sort of assume of, of the audience in, in most cases that they're kind of coming into to music with the same kind of spirit that I am, where if they're going to sit down and read this whole article, it, it's important to them. Uh, they're enthusiastic about it. They want to know more about it. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess I want to like enhance their, uh, their, like, their like appreciation for the artist or, or, or for the song that I'm writing about or, or the album or, or whatever. Sure. And that applies even when we talk about songs like Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, which five years <laughs> ago, you did a full-fledged feature for Mental Floss on the origin and history of the song. You've written a lot for the site since I'm a big Mental Floss fan. Um, it's a combination, I guess, journalism, journalism adjacent kind of uh, material, certainly. Uh, it's a lot of fun introductions to history, this very much being a fun introduction to history with the song Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. Uh, explain how that story came about and explain uh, what you learned about it. Yeah, so that was one where, that was actually not my pitch. I had, I had um, done some other stuff for uh, Mental Floss and one day the editor, I think, dropped me an email and was like, hey, do you want to just kind of do, do like an article just kind of like all about the history of, uh, you know, Grandma Got uh, Run Over by a Reindeer. And, and I think the way it was kind of presented, it was like, you know, I could have just kind of done the research on it and just sort of told the story of the song. Like I didn't, I didn't have to kind of reach out to uh, Dr. Elmo, who, who's the guy who sings the song. And, um, but I went to his website and I like discovered that he's actually pretty easy to track down. Like it wasn't like, you know, trying to get a hold of like Bruce Springsteen or something. It was like, if you want to talk to Dr. Elmo, you can probably talk to him. So I was like, well, you know, might as well. I mean, I've got an opportunity to talk to this guy. Might as well do it. Right. Um, so yeah, we had a great chat. It, it turns out he's a runner and, you know, I'm a runner as well. So we kind of bonded over that. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of tried to ask him some stuff that maybe people hadn't asked him about the song before. Cause he's, he's been talking about this every Christmas for whatever, like 40 years at this point, or whatever it is. But, and I think I actually did kind of find something that was at the end of the piece. Um, there's a part in the second verse of the song where like after grandma does get run over by the reindeer, it talks about how like grandpa just, I think he just, he's like in his chair drinking. He doesn't really care. He just kind of goes on with his business. And I was like, so like I asked, I asked Dr. Elmo, I was like, well, you know, like, like, is that just kind of like his way of, you know, grieving or like, you know, do you think maybe he just, you know, didn't really care about her anymore or whatever? He, he's like, yeah, I think he's wanted, like, I think he was kind of tired of the old lady. He just wanted to, you know, watch football and, and drink beer. But it's just kind of like this one little like nuanced part of that song that, you know, probably nobody even picks up on it because it's, there's so much other like weird, there's, there's like, there's a, you know, so many other weird things going on in that song, but. There, that's, all right, so that's two examples where you just get great quotes. How do you get great quotes? Yeah, I guess you just sort of, you know, do your homework a little bit and I don't know, try to think of, you know, I always like to, if I'm gonna do, I'm gonna interview with someone, I like to uh, read a bunch of interviews that uh, they've done and just, you know, try to get a sense of what they haven't been asked, uh, which, you know, can be tough sometimes for like people that have done a ton of press or, like if an artist is uh, plugging like a new record that's out and they're just, you know, talking about this record all over the place, um, you know, they probably get the same kind of questions. But yeah, if you can come up with something that, you know, this guy that's been talking about, you know, grandma got run over by a reindeer for like 40 years, if you can find like a new question about the song, that's, you know, I think that's, that's a good start to uh, getting someone to kind of open up and say something funny. Absolutely. And that brings us to your book. All right. The mechanics <laughs> of writing a book. 
uh, we're going to talk about here because you're actually, so this is our 50th uh, episode, uh, 50th interview. Now, congrats. You're the first person, you're the first person that I have talked uh, books about. Uh, we've had one or two other people that were, we've had a few other people that were authors, but we haven't really talked about the mechanics of writing a book. So I wanted to do that here. Uh, the book's Hell of a Hat, The Rise of 90s Ska and Swing. And I played a little bit of on, it on YouTube the last couple of days. <laughs> I was entertained. It's a little different. Uh, I want to zip ahead uh, in the origin story. We got your music background. How does, uh, how does a book like this come about for you? I guess it had sort of been in the back of my mind for a long time. Um, you know, this was the music that I loved when I was a, a, a teenager, really. You know, uh, ska music, I, I discovered it just before I went to high school, and it sort of uh, defined my, uh, you know, my four years in high school. And, you know, to a lesser extent, the swing stuff. But I, I always felt that it was kind of related. Um, so I'd always been kind of thinking about how I'd love, you know, to write a book about this one day. And, you know, as, as the, as, as, you know, time went by, I sort of realized that like, there were kind of no books about this time period. Like there's been, you know, ska books, um, but you know, ska's got a rich history going all the way back to you know, Jamaica in the late fifties. So there's been a lot of books that have kind of focused on the long history of ska or what they call the, the uh, second wave of ska, which was like in the UK in the seventies. Um, but there really hadn't been anything that just kind of focused on this stuff that, you know, that I was listening to in like the mid to late nineties, that really changed my life. Um, so it was kind of that. And then also I said earlier that I was going to like never actually like, you know, sort of uh, use my degree in economics, but I, I actually kind of did a little bit with this book because I remember thinking about how, when I was taking classes back in college, I, I had this one professor who would talk about how, um, you know, during the Clinton era, it was this sort of kind of like optimistic time and uh, you know, things were, you know, the, um, the sort of a GDP growth was like over 4% for a while and there were no major wars with like other countries. It was just kind of like, you know, brief little window before 9-11 where things were really kind of upbeat and, you know, the economy kind of showed that. And, you know, ska music of that time was this sort of happy music with a lot of horns and it's very danceable. And I guess over time, I just started to think more and more about how, well, like this music was kind of like a reflection of, of, of the culture at that time in the same way that, you know, grunge and like gangster rap, which had been popular in the early 90s, was kind of a, a you know, reflection of like the Gulf War and the LA riots and all these, it, you know, it was like a much darker time in like 92 than it was in like 98, you know? So that's kind of the underlying idea of the book. It, I mean, it doesn't really drive it to, you know, to the uh, um, extent that it, like every chapter is about that. I sort of talk about it in uh, the intro and like a few spots in the book. I, I'd say the book is more about the bands and just kind of telling their stories. But if there is kind of a thesis to it, it's that I think the reason why all these bands who had been kind of underground before, I think the reason why they were able to get, you know, um, sort of like major airplay and like MTV airplay was just because of what was going on sort of outside of music at that time. It was very upbeat. It was a yeah. very upbeat time, yeah. very upbeat music for the time. So the book's supremely comprehensive, and I say supremely uh, with uh, full endorsement. It's a definitive. Def it's a definitive history. It's encyclopedic, and it applies a lot of different skills. Uh, you review songs. You provide chronology. You quote people. Every chapter is three to four interviews with very prominent people in the field. I'm curious, what are the advantages and disadvantages of taking on a project that is somewhat of niche? Well, the advantages are that if it's if it's a subject you care about, it's you know it's uh, fantastic to kind of like immerse yourself in it. And um, I guess uh, disadvantages would be uh, potentially smaller audience, nowhere near as much money <laughs> as if you write something <laughs> about something else. It's, right. it's always going to be sort of a, a passion project that you're going to be trying to find your audience for it and. Um, I think once you find people that are of a, of a like mind, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll like hopefully really enjoy it and, and kind of flock to it. But um, yeah, it's not a, a general interest book, I guess. Although I did really in the kind of, in the bands that I chose to focus on, um, I really tried to, you know, focus on the bands that had the biggest national presence. Like either they were on major labels or they were on MTV or um, they were in movies maybe. Um, because I really wanted this book to possibly appeal to just any kid who, you know, I, I graduated high school in uh, 99. So like any kid that was like listening to alternative music in uh, 1999, you've like probably heard about a lot of these bands. Um, so like you, don't, like you don't necessarily have to be sort of a hardcore ska kid or like know how to swing dance to, I mean, not, 
I talk about, you know, Brian Setzer Orchestra and like Cherry Pop and Daddies. These were groups that had huge hits. So, you know, these songs, I think, are like implanted in, in the minds of uh, kids. Well, not uh, not uh, kids anymore. 40 year olds. People, people my age, yeah, 40 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so you talked to um, the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. You talked about the genre's connection to Gwen Stefani. You explained the genre shaping in different parts of the country. You explained the difference between the ska that you would see on MTV and other types of uh, ska. What's some of your favorite reporting from the book? I, I really enjoy talking to to the Boston's. They were a band that um, you know I'm, I'm from I'm from I'm from uh, New England. Uh, they're from uh, they're from Boston, obviously from, from their name. Uh, so they were sort of a you know they were definitely one of the formative groups for me growing up. And I, I was you know fortunate enough to uh, speak to two of the members of the band. And um, you know the book is named for one of their songs, um, "Hell of a Hat." It's sort of like a lesser known. I guess kind of like a deep cut that you know was never sit. Well, it, actually, it was a single, but it didn't it didn't go anywhere. Uh, it was like sort of before Scott caught on. But um, yeah, so to kind of talk to them and you know delve into a little bit uh, their song, the impression that I get, which is which, which was like a giant hit, you know, probably the biggest hit of like the '90s Scott era. Um, to kind of like unpack that song a little bit and kind of talk about what it, you know about what it meant. But um, yeah, I talked to a lot. Of, you know, I talked to like you know real big uh, fish who had a really put a real big hit <laughs> that pardon the pun <laughs> yep. um yeah I, I i don't know it was just it was cool to i think i was like you know kind of more um like in a weird way i've i've like talked to people that are like maybe like more famous than some of these bands but like you know because these bands meant so much to me when i was uh, 17 that you know like to like talk to the guy from like mustard plug on the phone was like it was like paul mccartney to me you know what i mean it was like <laughs> Um, so what was, uh, this is one for the people that are listening that are aspiring to write a book. What was your, oh crap, I'm writing a book moment? <laughs> Probably the day that I sent the contract back to the publisher saying I had to write it. <laughs> Cause it was actually a really short, uh, turnaround. Like I, like, I think I had, you know, six or seven months to actually write it. And at that point I had written like an intro chapter and I, I, yeah, I, I had I had the intro and I finished one of the chapters that that had actual band interviews in it because I just wanted to, um, you know, like I think that was like part of the reason why I, like I got the deal was like a proof of okay, like here's an actual chapter of you know what this thing's going to look like, you know, but that still left a lot of like a lot of interviewing and a lot of writing to do. So yeah, I would say right off the bat, I had that moment. <laughs> I feel your pain. Two weeks in, uh, two weeks in, I was ready to stop <laughs> on mine. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I got a, uh, the thing was I got over it as yeah. did you clearly. Yeah, uh, you sort of just you just kind of have to, right? Yeah, exactly. You kind of alluded to this earlier. Uh, I'm curious uh, how was there any moment that happened where you got someone to really open up to you? Yeah, uh, I was actually going to say um, uh, Monique Powell from, yep. from the band from, from the uh, band Safe Ferris. Uh, yeah, that was actually a really. Um, yeah, that was a great interview. We, I think, spoke for like two hours or something. And she really, yeah, kind of opened up a lot about her time with the band and kind of what it meant to her, you know, looking back in hindsight, um, you know, she talks a lot about, um, you know, the band played on the Warp Tour. This was like the big, you know, punk rock kind of touring festival back in the, well, I mean, actually went for a long time. It, it didn't, it didn't end until very recently, but it was, it just started out in uh, the nineties. And she kind of talked about you know, being one of the only uh, women on, on that tour and how she kind of looks back on it now and is like, wow, that was like, that was cool that I was able to kind of get up there and do my thing in this, you know, kind of you know, sea of, you know, dudes basically. And um, yeah, she was very candid about some of the stuff that she went through during the making of, of their second album. She had some, you know, real tough times with a, with a breakup and some other things. And um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 had, I talked to her one time before, actually, I'd, I'd um, interviewed her for one other story about two years prior. So maybe it was because we had talked before and we kind of had, you know, like had a good uh, rapport. But um, yeah, she's very frank and honest. And uh, yeah, it was it was you know, fun talking to her. Looking back on it now, if you were going to give someone advice on how to go about a first book, <laughs> what do you got? Uh, don't write about ska music. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta, you're, gonna have a, you're gonna have a hard time. Like, A, you're gonna have a, a tough time finding an agent. Uh, Cause like that took me about, I think almost a year to find an agent. And then that agent's gonna have a hard time selling it. I think that took almost a year also. So like all told this thing had already been kind of going on for two years by the time that I, I got the deal and it, and it was like, okay, now you got you know six or seven months. But no, I guess I would say, 
obviously write about something that you really care about because you're going to be pretty immersed in it for the duration of the writing process. I guess make sure that your spouse can tolerate it. I, I played so much ska and swing music around my wife that it's. <laughs> now we should mention your wife's a journalist too, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. She actually wrote a book. Uh, Lindsay Stanberry is, uh, is 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 her name, and she wrote uh, Money Diaries. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like like that was sort of I think you know also part of the inspiration for me writing this is like uh, I'm gonna write a book. Like you know, my wife wrote a book. It was great. I want to try that too. You know, like it it always seemed like it was this kind of mystifying thing, like like you could never do it in a million years, but I, I think watching her do it and, you know, watching her do it so well, it's like, wow, this actually seems like maybe the kind of thing that if you kind of put your mind to it, you could, you could maybe do it. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I maybe did it. I don't know. We'll see. No, I think you did. We'll, what, we'll see what how people want, like it. But. What do you want people to take away from reading it? Well, I think, I think both of these genres, um, you know, Scott and swing, especially of, of the nineties, I think they get a, a kind of a bad name these days. I think, um, you know, people think of it as being this kind of, you know, goofy kind of frivolous music that didn't really mean anything. And it's, it, you know, it's often mocked in the pop culture. There's a lot of like, you know, sitcom jokes about, you know, being a ska person back in the nineties or whatever. And it's, you know, there's you know plenty of memes on the internet that kind of make fun of ska fans. And um, so I guess I want to sort of, all, all the bands that I talk about in the book, I want people to kind of take them seriously. And, you know, let's, you know, talk about their records in the same way that we would talk about bands from any other genre. And let's, you know, give them that respect at least. And then, you know, like I was mentioning earlier with some of the stuff about my, I guess my kind of overarching theory about why this stuff got so popular when it did. Um, I'd like people to, I guess, kind of consider that and, you know, think about the late nineties in, in a different way. And, you know, because I never really heard anybody kind of talk about, like, you always hear people talk about the kind of angsty, you know, Gen X 90s, and that kind of accounts for Nirvana and some of the stuff that was popular before the stuff that, that's kind of in my book. But, you know, I don't often hear people talk about the sort of upbeat 90s and kind of what that meant for the culture. And, you know, people talk about, I don't know, Backstreet Boys and like teen pop. And, I, you know, I think that was part of it, too. I think that was very much like a reflection of, of the sort of wider culture. But I, I, I think Scott and Swing in their own way you know, for the alternative kids kind of serve the same, uh, same function. You did something after you wrote the book that I thought was, to pardon the pun, genius. Um, <laughs> I don't think we've talked to anyone in the, the 49 previous episodes who has a sub stack, and you do. And I'm going to take an educated guess here that at least some of it came about because you wrote too much and didn't want to leave good work unpublished. Uh, explain what your newsletter is that's kind of supplementing the book. Yeah, so that was true for um, yeah for one part of it. Yeah, for one article that I published out of the out of the five or six that I've done. Um, yeah, there was uh, a part about a band that I had to cut, and I was I was you know pretty upset about it, and I I didn't want it to just kind of live on my hard drive forever. So <laughs> um, yeah, I thought that would be a cool way to get it out there. But actually, most of it has been sort of bands that I that I never talked to for the book, because I just couldn't like find a way to slot them into any of the chapters. Yeah, they were maybe too underground, or they just didn't fall into one of the categories. But these were bands that I also loved growing up a lot. Um, so I was just thought, this would be a really cool way to sort of like tell their story. And yeah, you know, some of these are bands that like their story has never really been kind of documented. I mean, there's, you know, like I did this band out of Boston, a Thumper, who is this sort of they mixed like ska and metal, but they were also very, um, they had songs about politics and like religion and they were really, um, you know, pretty ahead of their time. And also just like, you know, really cutting with their lyrics and really kind of smart and uh, sharp. And, you know, Thumper had never really been kind of covered anywhere with their, with their full story. So um, I thought I'll just take a chance. And, you know, I, I found the singer on YouTube and uh, he, he was more than happy to talk. We talked for like 90 minutes or two hours and, you know, and it was like, just going to be for the sub stack. It wasn't going to be for the book, but he, you know, like he wasn't upset about that. He was just like, yeah, that's cool. And so, yeah, there was, there was like a few of these bands that I was just, I was like super happy to have the opportunity just to kind of get their story out there. Yep. And this is, it's a great way to, to publicize the book, uh, yeah, through, yeah. through supplemental work. So the big takeaway is here, be heartfelt, document the undocumented, research the heck out of things, and don't be afraid to create other, um, ways to show off your content, like a sub stack. Is there a gap in the music journalism industry that a young person could fill? Not, uh, not uh, I'd say not for Scott books because there's actually a three this year that came out. <laughs> right, <laughs> all right, but just I'm talking yeah, music, yeah, um, music journalism industry as a whole. 
Yeah, that, that that's a good that, that's a good question. I, I I was I was thinking about this one earlier, and I, I was having a hard time. Uh, I mean, like the cool thing about I mean, I guess obviously you know the internet sort of uh, democratizes everything, and like anyone can have their own Substack or their own blog or, or whatever. So you know, all these sort of, you know, super niche topics, I think, are, are being covered in a way that they never would have been, you know, certainly when I was in high school, you would just sort of read Rolling Stone and maybe spin. And that was kind of it. Like if that was kind of how you found out about music. So, um, and, you know, podcasting too, like, it's like, it's cool that so many people are, you know, uh, you know, talking about music that way. Um, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is there's sort of, there's kind of no limit anymore to if it's, the most obscure thing, as long as you care about it, you can, you can put it out there. And it, you know, thanks to uh, social media, which obviously has its uh, ups and downs, you, you can, you know, seek out the audience for it. Maybe there's uh, like at least a hundred people on, you know, Twitter that probably care about anything. Like, I mean, like almost any topic you could think of, there's like that Twitter, you know? So um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I think I think the gap is, you know, the gap is whatever you sort of perceive it to be, and you can and you can fill it now. And nice, that's that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I mean, as long as you don't want to get rich because you're not going to. <laughs> yeah, you should probably you should probably have a side job at the same time. <laughs> there you go. All right, last question: Is there a journalism organization that you would like to salute? You know what? I'll I'll give a shout out to one of my fellow uh, you know ska book writers this year, Aaron Carnes, who wrote a book called called him In Defense of Ska. It's, 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 a, it's a fantastic book. It, it's a sort of a broader look at like, not just the you know, 90s stuff that I talk about. He kind of looks at the genre, the whole you know, 50, 60 year history of it. Um, he has a podcast that's called, that's, uh, you know, called him In Defense of Scott, just like the book. And uh, he, like in addition to just sort of getting you know, people that played in like important bands, he'll have just kind of weird people on like you know, stand up comedians who just happen to like ska or maybe a guy from like a metal band who is kind of like a secret Scott fan or something. So just, you know, kind of looking at it from uh, different angles and um, I don't know why that pops into my head, but yeah, I mean, I think he's doing good work. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw him the show. I like it. That's uh, that's definitely an unusual one for us. Uh, <laughs> Ken Partridge. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Ah, oh, thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. Welcome to journalism history, a podcast that rips out the pages of your history books to re-examine the stories you thought you knew and the ones you were never told. I'm Terry Finneman, and I research media coverage of women in politics. And I'm Nick Hershon, and I research the history of New York sports. And I'm Ken Ward, and I research the journalism history of the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains. Find the Journalism History Podcast at journalism-history.org podcast, and wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. We've done so many serious topics, that was just fun, and it's good to mix it up. One of our goals was to talk to every type of journalist, and I'm glad Ken was able to join us to talk music journalism. His book, Hell of a Hat, The Rise and Fall of 90s Ska and Swing, is out today, the 21st, the day we post this podcast. You can get it wherever you buy books. And I'm telling you, it's about 250 pages, and it is extremely comprehensive. It's both an easy read and a very comprehensive one. Anyway, 50 episodes down, still going. If you want to help us out, just let someone know we exist. Do you know a college student who's an aspiring journalist? Do you know someone who's burned out and in need of a little motivation and inspiration? Tell them about our podcast. Thanks for listening. Back in two weeks with sports enterprise writer Alex Coffey. Hope you'll tune in for that one as well. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. Please let us know what you think of the show. You can find us on Twitter at JournalismPod. And you can email us at JournalismSalute at gmail.com.